I'm going to talk about something that absolutely did not work, um, as is so often the case in academic research. Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about what quantum computing is for everyone to be aware of and how important it is. So, every talk about quantum computing starts with Moore's Law, and I didn't want to do that, and I ended up doing it. Moore's Law tells us that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles roughly every five years. And along with that, the speed and sophistication of computing um, at a commensurate rate. The problem we have is that this has driven so much of our economics, so much of our industry, and cannot continue indefinitely. Because transistors are getting down to atomic scales. And a few hundred atoms of silicon does not behave like bulk silicon, the material. This, uh, that was Dr. Moore, and that is transistor count over time. Um, and at the, in the recent years, it's actually outpaced uh, the predictions of Moore's law. So, what are the problems that occur on the quantum scale? Uh, and if I want to convey anything about quantum mechanics, I always find this image wonderful. Um, this is a surface of copper with a ring of iron atoms placed upon it. And what has happened is that electrons which move absolutely freely in the copper do not move freely past a barrier of iron atoms. So you can see what the scale is here. It's extraordinarily uh, high resolution. These are individual atoms you're looking at with a spacing of about a tenth of a nanometer. So a tenth of a millionth of a millimeter. Um, the Waves you see in there, you have heard this concept, I have no doubt, that in quantum mechanics, particles can have this odd behavior. They can be a bit like a wave, a bit like a particle. Well, that's what you're looking at. This is not just an imaginary picture. This is very much a real thing. And we see this here. These are electrons behaving as waves. And they have formed a standing wave pattern in there. And that is absolutely not the behavior that you are looking at when you are thinking about um, bulk silicon and its behavior in the transistor. So we have a lower limit to the size of our current models of computing. We need some new ones. But our new ones have to account for the fact we're operating at a quantum mechanical scale. Um, so we need to understand a concept called superposition here. Um, electrons can behave like a wave, that's true. Two waves that meet each other will interfere by superposing. Uh, anyone who, who's studied some physics will be aware of the fact that if two waves meet in a certain place, they add up, and this can create constructive or destructive interference. And the same thing happens with electrons. The effect of this in an atom is to produce these wonderful clouds of likelihood of finding an atom. These are the orbitals of the atom. Now, what do the electrons do? So, in an atom, an electron can be in any number of positions, and each one is represented by, a, each position is represented by a state vector, it's called. It just says, I am here. Now, until it's measured, the electron exists as a wave function, a combination superposition of all possible state vectors where it can be. And the function that says, I'm more likely to be here, I'm less likely to be here, is called the wave function. And that's the only thing that describes the electron. You cannot say where the electron is. You can define its wave function, a set of places it could be. Only when you make a measurement does it end up in one state. So let's have a look at a quantum computer. So a classical computer stores and processes information as bits. These are binary digits that can be a one or a zero. And the bits can be voltages, magnetizations. When they're stored on a hard disk, they're magnetized, demagnetized when they're stored, or when they're in computer memory, they're high and low voltages. We use gates to make decisions based on these, and that's computation. That's an AND gate up there on the right, and it will produce a one, a high voltage its output, only if it gets a couple of ones into its inputs. Now, quantum computing is different, because it allows any possible superposition of one and zero in every single step. So if I have a single qubit, it could be 70% 1 and 30% 0. But things get really interesting when I have multiple qubits. 
because I can have a linear combination of every single permutation of ones and zeros possible. So that as soon as I've got, say, four qubits, I have two to the four possible values, but then I have any linear combination of those two to the four possible values. When I do computations, I do them on every possible state of the computer at once, which makes it profoundly powerful. The ability for the multiple state, the multiple qubits, to form one so-called wave function, one so-called state that can be in a superposition of states, requires them to experience what is called entanglement, a coherent quantum mechanical behavior between them. And it, uh, entanglement will be a key characteristic in what we're talking about here. Why does quantum computing matter? I've got to mention Shaw's algorithm. Everything we do in cryptography when we send passwords, credit card details over the internet is based on um, something called public key cryptography. Uh, and the way that effectively works, it's been described as sending someone a design for a lock that you know how to unlock, but from which the key cannot be inferred from the design. How is that achieved? It's achieved using mathematical functions that work one way. And in particular, it is very easy for a computer to take two large prime numbers, multiply them together, and get an answer. It is impossible in a short time for a classical computer to take a large product of two primes and infer what two numbers, what two unique numbers can be multiplied together to produce that. A quantum computer can do that trivially and will break all the cryptography we have. Before you panic about that, it also introduces a new cryptography that's unbreakable even in principle, but that will not be the focus of our talk. Why are quantum computers hard? The problem is heat and complexity and size. Uh, there is a thing called decoherence. It destroys quantum superposition. It occurs when a system is not isolated from its environment and starts to interact. This is, in effect, starting the measurement process that projects the system into one state and says, I am a one, I am a zero, I am no longer a superposition. This electron is here. This cat is dead. You have probably encountered Schrodinger's cat. It's criticism of quantum mechanics suggesting that the cat in a box where a quantum mechanically controlled process like radioactive decay determines whether a file of poison is broken and kills the cat. The idea is that until you look in the box, the cat is in a superposition of alive and dead, and this is ridiculous. Um, most physicists are happy with the idea that this is not the case, and the cat is a sufficiently complex system that decoherence occurs, the process by which the system is projected into one state or the other of alive or dead. Although there are other interpretations there. Some say the wave function never collapses. I don't intend to get into interpretations of quantum mechanics, although many will know my tendency to diverge. So, quantum computers need to be kept very cold and very isolated. So current paradigms, and this is a proof of concept built by Google at phenomenal cost, and it's only a few qubits. It can't do a great deal. And it's not scalable. Adding one more qubit is a whole equivalent uh, engineering problem to what has come already. Current paradigms involve trapping atoms with electromagnetic fields and keeping them isolated at very low temperature. It's not scalable. They operate with a few handfuls of qubits, not the trillions of transistors we're used to in computers. Is there an alternative? Can we draw qubits on a surface as you would with a transistor? Well, the original ideas for a solid state quantum computer, much like our current computers, were uh, very non scalable. They involved precision placement of atoms one at a time uh, using an STM tip. Takes for ages. Um, so what can we do? Well, Marshall Stoneham, fellow of the Royal Society and head of my research group, CMMP at UCL, proposed a new paradigm, which is to distribute clusters of atoms at random on a substrate, create little clusters, and they would represent some quantum states. And you would be able to do a kind of characterization to discover how they interact. 
and then you would find a way of addressing the interactions that already existed. It was the idea of a sort of found quantum computer. It remains a work in progress. Uh, another possibility proposed by Gabriel Apley, I was involved in research on this, and my professor, my, my PI on that was um, Professor Andrew Fisher, who still works at UCL, uh, a fantastic fellow. Um, and this involved frustrated magnetism. Frustrated magnet is where I take something like um, lithium yttrium fluoride, a non magnetic salt, but in the place of yttrium in the lattice, you can put holmium, which is magnetic. So you can naturally grow from a mixture of holmium and, it and yttrium a magnet where it's a beautifully regular crystal structure, but magnetic dipoles are distributed completely randomly within it, forming clusters. The idea is that we observe that some of these clusters could be set to ring magnetically, oscillate back and forth with an electromagnetic field for macroscopically long times, seconds, which is forever in computing, in, 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 in this world of quantum mechanics. The idea here is that if we could demonstrate that these entangled with one another, and there was evidence they might, sadly I discovered they didn't, that we would be able to use these in quantum computing. This particular crystal cannot be used in that way. The, there is entanglement, but it's within individual clusters and can't be used to couple them and set up multiple qubits in this way. But the hunt continues for a solid state system of quantum computing. And I'm no longer involved in that one, but uh, thank you all very, very much for your attention. <laughs>